no way of being prepared for Titer. Um, see, Titer um, uh, aired in, uh, on uh, Kiku Television in Honolulu in 1975. It was a Japanese live action uh, television series um, that uh, uh, was about uh, a, a young man who drove a motorcycle with a, uh, an acoustic guitar slung around his back and um, when uh, problems uh, occurred, uh, namely a, a, a terrorist organization named DARK that was hunting down and killing children, um, <laughs> Iron, uh, uh, Jiro would jump off his motorcycle, um, go through a series of uh, change uh, positions, and flip into this incredible red and blue robot uh, where half of his head, you could see inside, and there were these going on, uh, I was completely blown away. It was amazing <laughs> to me. It was so serious stuff. People were dying. He was fighting the monsters with Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. um, uh, lasers were going off. Uh, I, I just couldn't believe it. Um, and I was reading those subtitles. Um, and a friend of mine told me that um, uh, Kikaider's origin, which was not in the show for some reason, could be found in a comic book that was in Japanese, I had to go uh, uh, to a, a strange store um, uh, uh, several miles away to find uh, uh, Kaider's origin. And then I had to get a friend to translate uh, the, um, the story to me. Now, the Kaider series ended as most uh, live action Japanese um, uh, children's shows end uh, these days. And uh, that's with almost everyone dead. <laughs> I don't understand it, but it was amazing. Uh, and the, the uh, central battle was unresolved. Kikaider had not conquered uh, the villain. Um, so um, uh, I, I, uh, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> but, uh, but then I learned there was a feature film done in Japan uh, that finished the story. So uh, that film came to Hawaii and was in a theater that was like 10 miles away from my house on the bad side of Honolulu. Believe it or not, there was one. Um, uh, well, I couldn't get anybody to take me, um, so I had to uh, figure out which bus went out there. Um, and by myself, for the first time, I got on that bus and journeyed into the seedy area of, of Honolulu, um, uh, walked into this decrepit movie theater, um, uh, put my feet off the floor and, and hugged them because I did not know what was moving around down there and watched Kikaider take on all of the monsters that were in the series before kicking the ass of the final villain. <laughs> on my way back home, I thought, this is what I want to do. Um, this is a world I want to be in. This is the kind of story I want to tell. I want to tell a story that's so cool that some idiot kid is going to make these jumps um, and, and take these journeys in order to learn what happens next. Um, and uh, people uh, in the past um, uh, 20 or 30 years, um, this kind of storytelling um, is now something that has taken a second nature uh, to young people, um, not not your your even your Gen Ys for that matter, but the, the newest generation of, of people, the kids that are watching uh, uh, Clone Wars right now, and simply assume that the universe that um, that they want to be involved with uh, is going to show up whenever they want it, uh, wherever they want it, and and they'll go after it. Um, it took me a while. But eventually, um, I, uh, I figured out how to, to do this and do it uh, kind of successfully. Um, the universes uh, that I've become involved with um, to help uh, spin stories and, and extend the brand, extend that narrative, include uh, Pirates of the Caribbean for the Walt Disney Company, Halo for Microsoft, Transformers for Hasbro, uh, the, the new Tron uh, revival uh, for Disney is, is spectacular, and of course in two weeks everybody's going to learn about Avatar. Uh, 
James Cameron's film. So look what was going on in my head before um, uh, uh, Keith Heider and before Star Wars. Um, uh, to me, you, I, I went to see the movie. There might have been a board game or some crude video game that roughly retold the story of the movie, and then a, a book that, again, kind of semi-poorly told the story of the movie. Um, so I was getting an experience that was kind of repeating on itself like a bad corned beef sandwich. Um, uh, with transmedia, I was putting things together like a puzzle in my mind, and they actually fit. And there is an elegance. There, there's something that happens when you are kind of filling in some of the gaps, and when some of the gaps are filled in for you at a later date or on another media platform. Um, it makes you move from being kind of happy with the movie you saw to, to coming back to the property over and over again, uh, to telling your friends uh, about it, you know, kind of becoming a, a proselytizer, eventually uh, a torchbearer, somebody who's really uh, going to uh, participate hard, um, to the point where there is this amazing sense of loyalty, of possession, of uh, a kind of love that, that develops between you and this aspirational world, this large narrative. So what are the uh, defining principles of transmedia storytelling? Uh, these have kind of caught on, and, um, and I'm with the Producers Guild of America, and they have uh, em embraced uh, these principles. I, they are not meant to be academic, they are not meant to be necessarily definitive, but I have uh, um, uh, created these essentially as a kind of self-defense mechanism to make sure I get paid. Um, <laughs> um, so, the, the defining principles, number one, um, we can't make these things by uh, a kind of huge uh, committee. Um, the, these uh, visions that will uh, uh, need to be uh, derived um, as, as one would derive any uh, good and wonderful story like Lost or um, Film, uh, TV shows of that, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, the rollout, um, at its best, is planned early in the life of the franchise. Um, uh, in, in the earlier projects that Starlight Runner took on, we were paid out of marketing. Um, and uh, essentially, we